Hello, everyone. We are going to begin our webinar. Thank you so much for attending today. We just want to let you know before we begin that if you have any questions during this webinar, please feel free to use the chat feature up at the top right. And this will be a private chat that we can answer your questions and attend to after the webinar. So please sit back and enjoy. We're, we will be getting right now. Hello and welcome to another Archon Security Alert and Workshop. Here today I've got Joe Malarkey, our subject matter expert. Say hello, Joe. How are you, everybody? Thanks for having me. Great to have you. I appreciate you coming down to our headquarters from uh, terrible sunny Florida as the fall kind of winds down here in Chicago. Great to have you. Today we've got to cover uh, a, a bunch of cool topics that are now uh, coming to the forefront from COVID. Uh, as everybody knows, things have changed in the, the landscape, and uh, with that, Archon would love to use this opportunity to kind of share some of the things we're seeing in the marketplace, but also a little bit from our customer base and you know what our customers are seeing. Um, specifically, we're going to be talking about ransomware and account compromise. Joe, lots changed since March, kind of threw everything for a loop with plans and, and security. Walk us through how, how, how it's changed for ransomware and account. Sure. So, well, even uh, before that, you know, um, uh, 10 years ago, everyone was inside the corporate boundary. We were protected by firewalls. So both the user and the applications like email that they accessed were all right there. Uh, now, over the years, a lot of that has been transferred, the services anyway, to the cloud, like Exchange Online, Office 365. But now in the last year, we've seen a huge uptick for obvious reasons in users being remote. They're no longer in the corporate boundary. They themselves are now all over the place, you know, at homes or wherever. So now we have both the users and the, uh, the services in the cloud. So easily attackable. Uh, and that has, of course, uh, sparked a huge increase uh, in uh, both ransomware and account compromise. And in fact, the FBI statistics have shown just in the early part of this year that these attacks have increased fourfold, so quadrupled. So a lot of the things that we're going to talk about, uh, you know, were, uh, let's say, options just a few months ago at the beginning of the year but now they've actually become table stakes they're they're the minimum so from nice to have to need to have exactly nice to have the need to have good way to put it so <laughs> now we we're, we're looking at uh, uh you know a minimum level of uh of, of tools and procedures and configurations that really need to be in place in order to get you know let's let's call it 99 percent of the attacks uh, you know, to thwart most of that so that you're, you're starting at a minimum basic security level that's going to thwart most of that and then we can build from there. So ransomware is a virus that infects a computer via several vectors, probably the number one would be email, which we'll talk about, and it, uh, it is made to encrypt someone's hard drive or, or a good portion of it. And then, of course, you, you have the ransom after that. They demand money in order to release the encryption key. So if your stuff is really important and you don't have a copy of it anywhere, you're kind of stuck. Send that Bitcoin and you get your system Bitcoin. back. Maybe. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. And, it, it, and that's probably a form of crypto locking. But, you know, we do see also attacks where um, intellectual property just walks out the door. Sure. Do we lock it down? Uh, do we even know where it went? How many times was it open? Where was it open? Um, a lot of times, you know, these attacks show their show the, the attack well after it's even happened. So what are some of the tools? How can we start solving this? Where, where would uh, the general users start to make sure that they are doing you know, the minimal things that they need to do to tighten things up? Sure, well, we, we'd probably look at four uh, different layers and we do want to take a layered approach. So one, uh, one uh, protection is never going to be enough. We would need to catch things at different areas. So the first thing we would talk about since the number one attack vector is going to be email, it's, it's too easy. You know, I can sit halfway around the world, send an email to someone and potentially take over their company at this point. I can certainly deliver malware, I can certainly deliver ransomware. So ransomware is really delivered most often by email. So we would start with a secure email. Uh, something like a Mimecast secure email, which would do two big things. Number one, 
check uh, for uh, uh, URLs, links that people get in emails, and also check the downloads that they get in emails. These are the two favored methods for delivering ransomware. You click on a link, it brings you to a website that in turn downloads some ransomware, or you just get a, a download that you download directly in an attachment, and that installs the ransomware. So uh, tools like Mimecast's Secure Email can, they'll actually uh, uh, redo the URL and point to their system so they can check it to see if it's a known uh, bad URL, if it's, on a, if it's on a, let's call it a naughty list. Sure. And also check the download uh, for signs that it might be uh, some type of malware. So the user can still scan their email, but at the same time, they can also continue doing their work without having to access that possibly infected file, possibly infected URL. Uh, and continue on balancing both the security requirements and also the user's ability to continue the work if it's a false positive. Exactly, um, exactly. So also with Mimecast, does that also offer the ability for users to start you know, flagging emails as they come in, kind of putting them into its own bucket and putting the, putting the decisions a little bit more on the user base sure. so that if, if a pattern evolves from the user base, then it automatically gets quarantined? Sure, yeah, so we follow, we would follow that up exactly with something like user awareness training. So, you know, you're not gonna catch everything with uh, the, uh, the secure email. In fact, if you, if you try and catch everything, you're probably going to kill, uh, you know, user usability in production. No so, PDFs arrive alive. Exactly, and, and there's a lot of things that are just gonna get through that. You know, there's no perfect solution. So the next thing that we would like to do is get some uh, security awareness training to the user. So something engaging, something fun, uh, you so know, something that can in, test. Two guys in old 80s suits coming, <laughs> yeah. Bob and Bob, talking about all the wonderful the world for, for 12 hour seminars and exactly. sleepy workers. Is that kind of where you're going or? Yeah, eliminate the changed? bobs. It's gotta be something that engages people, something that can also aggregate uh, the results uh, keep score, test on it, uh, something that's not negative, but something that's positive uh, for the users, and, and just uh, something that really teaches them, including uh, phishing tests, where we send out emails and we see the results of that. And really, uh, that engages people like nothing else. So good videos, good uh, direct communication, uh, good tests, and people really start paying a lot more attention when, so you, when we do those things. So this has now moved from the traditional sense, which, I mean, I think everybody agrees those are kind of old hat, um, dry, dry. You're probably losing your message in the first hour of those seminars. And sure. Light, most likely, if you haven't lost them by, uh, by lunch, uh, once lunch is kicked in, everybody's asleep. Um, but it sounds like things are moving to digestible modules where you can then hit five minute videos, work your way through a, through a chart of to-dos, yeah. score yourself, see how you score compared to others. Also just knowing um, you know, whether you've completed the compliance module with HIPAA or maybe a finance module or even just a type of attack like a thumb drive. Exactly, yeah. So uh, that's come a long way and, and really it's, it's to the point now where it really, really does help a lot. And it's all from the cloud? No, no, we don't have to have people visiting everybody's home and walking to the Don't church. have to, no, it can all be delivered remotely and it can be set up fairly quickly. So our third layer of defense would be uh, antivirus. And there's really a, a sea change now happening with antivirus. So a traditional antivirus is a signature-based antivirus where uh, an antivirus will have a dictionary of uh, known signatures, of known viruses, variations of the known viruses, and they'll check every file that comes in. If it matches, we flag it. Or, you know, maybe some bit of uh, heuristics and rules built into that to maybe catch something extra, but very little. Traditionally static. Traditionally large static. Large database. Exactly. Maybe daily, but at best efforts. Sure. So now, though, uh, the industry and Archon is moving towards artificial intelligence uh, antivirus. This is antivirus that has the best of both worlds. It still has, it can still detect things from signatures because that's pretty easy and that's pretty fast. But the artificial intelligence will start to look for behaviors of files and other signals that would flag something as a potential threat. Then that threat can be isolated, it can be tested, exploded, if you will, in a virtual environment to see what happens. And if a virus or, a, or, or something bad is found, 
that can centrally be communicated to all the endpoints so they immediately know about it and they don't even let the threat in. So something like WannaCry or another zero day attack could instantly be stopped in its tracks if you've got what amounts to probably a, a $2 uptick per user AV exactly. that's powered by AI. And it's, and it's not like you're running the AI engine. This is something that you can deploy to kind of just better your posture against ransomware. Exactly, yeah. And not perfect, nothing is. Sure. But this goes well beyond the standard uh, antivirus uh, and can catch the zero days, the things that no one has a signature for. And that is becoming more and more prevalent the, these uh, bad actors are making their own variants and they test them against the signatures that are out there. They know that they're not going to be caught. So we really need something. We really need to go beyond what we're doing right now into the art artificial intelligence to, to really catch these new threats. So as the variants come out, and some people might even call them mutations, it, the AI can actually pick up a mutation that's within 80%, 90% like to the original and with AI, it would say this is likely just an adaptation, a mutation of the original virus. Put that in quarantine, stop it in its tracks, tell all nodes on the, on sure. the network. And it's all cloud-driven, correct? All cloud-driven, centrally driven. Uh, so once something is detected, very quickly all endpoints are updated. Real time. Nice to hear. So worst case scenario, and we're just going to keep going down that, that layered onion until we get to the core. You've lost everything. Somebody just messed up. Maybe you deploy two out of the three of these, you know, simple ransomware tool defenses. Are you are you done? You got to close this close up shop. Could you have done anything previous to not taking the, you know, sure. What could you have done to avoid it? Assuming you you missed one of the three or one of five or you know, what could you have done pretty simply to fix this? Yeah, and and you don't have to miss anything. Uh, things are going to get through. There's no way around it. We must assume that that's going to happen. So uh, if that is the case, then we have to plan ahead. And the planning ahead part means making sure that we have not just that one copy of the data, making sure that we have other copies of the data. And one of the easiest ways to configure that, and then ways that frankly are built into Windows uh, uh, and the cloud service right now, is to have a cloud sync like Microsoft OneDrive. We're very uh, uh, simple to deploy and what it will do is copy everything from uh, uh, your hard drive, a, a subset of folders, your important stuff, documents and other things, uh, to the cloud. And uh, that uh, prevents that virus or the, the ransomware from, having, or from encrypting the only copy of it. Because remember, when, when a virus does this, it only has control over that one machine. It's encrypted that hard drive. It's not doing anything to the cloud. So your cloud files are safe. So if that were the case, uh, what we could do is simply maybe even hand the user a brand new PC, uh, get it up to speed, have their cloud account uh, synced with it once again, and they'd be going with all of their files unchanged. In fact, while they were doing that, they could just use a web client to go and get their OneDrive files. How, does, how do these tools kind of relay into account compromise? Because if they're trying to get into your network, they're probably trying to get in for a reason. How does that kind of parlay to the accounts of your users and how do these tools kind of help with that as well? Sure. So, yeah, as we're talking about this, if you were to look at uh, uh, a list of the top threats, you Google the top threats or whatever, you would see ransomware at the top and then you'd see account compromise uh, right there at the top as well. Account compromise is simply taking over someone's account. Uh, and the normal way to do that is you guess or you steal someone's password. That's been a traditional way to do it. I steal your password, now I'm you. I can log on as you, I can get to your email maybe without you even knowing about it uh, in the first place. So uh, there's several, again, layers of defense that we can put onto that, and a lot of them dovetail with the ransomware layer. So for instance, uh, the secure email. Well, a lot of this is delivered via email, delivered via a link that tricks you into typing in your password. You might get an email that says uh, your password's been compromised. They use it against you. They will give you, they will point you to a link that looks exactly like the password portal where you change your password. You change your password there, the crooks get your password. They might even change your real password so you don't become aware of this. And meanwhile, they can sit back and glean all the knowledge they want and then wait for the moment to attack. So that works for account compromise as well. Security awareness training. Well, once again, these things are delivered. Uh, a huge percentage of them are delivered via email. So once again, 
telling users of what to be aware of. You know, don't click on things. Uh, why not to click on things? Don't put like a USB drive uh, in uh, a found USB drive that you found in a parking lot. Don't put that in your computer. Sure. So all there, you know, it's not email is not the only vector. So we want to cover all these things and just get people in the habit of thinking about these on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, and a lot of those a lot of those modules you're talking about security awareness are actually gleaned from, you know, active attacks, social engineering attacks that have worked. So Absolutely. they're really not recreating the wheel here. They're they're deploying stuff that really is the highest percentage of probability of getting into your users. Absolutely. Um, and also kind of walk me through a little bit about, you know, payloads and how how those get picked off today with with tools like with Mimecast, how do they strip payloads? Because I've also heard where, you know, a, a C-suite executive is going to some trade show or going to an M&A deal and opens up an email with a payload tracker. Well, you know, they might not get to the content, but how is the data that follows that email and the payload, how does that work against the user if you could put the puzzle together? Sure. So when you send an email, uh, a lot of the information about where you are and uh, uh, you know the address and the equipment that you're using actually is embedded in the email. So people can tell where you were when you sent an email. So if you sent an email, let's say from the beach in Aruba, well, that part of that uh, IP address and other information is actually going to be in the email. And when someone gets that email, they can look through that. You're not going to see it in a normal client, but the information is there. You can open it up and you can glean that information right from that. So we can tell where you are, uh, what equipment you're using, way too much information. Yeah. And tools like Mimecast can also strip that information out of an email so it cannot be used against you. So trackers that are embedded get stripped automatically. So no user that sends you an email and you open it ever reports back where you are, what device you open cross-pollinate that with social media and they may know you're you know you're talking to their competitor or you right. know if for, if you don't need that information out there why not strip it off anyway just the knowledge that you're on that beach in Aruba tells everyone you're on vacation you're harder to reach and this is these are the times that crooks like to strike uh, because the, the, you're not around to answer questions they can they can use that time to get further along in their scheme seeing a social engineering email hey I'm in Aruba right now hey, well he is in Aruba so that's got to be him exactly uh, and exactly there you go. great way to, to mine data that's personal and, uh, and again it opens up the attack vectors nonetheless mm -hmm. so stripping those payloads are, are a great you know thing that people maybe overstep but you do get real-time alerts as well in these emails. So even before the user clicks on it, if it just says the you know CEO's name or C-suite's name, mm -hmm. you'll get a banner alert as well saying, "Hey, this looks like the, your user's name, but this this email address does not you know cross-reference with what we know your C-suite is using." Is that correct? Yeah, it's nice to get some feedback right to the user and tell them something that might be important to them. We don't want to overload them with that, so we want to pick and choose when they see it. And it's the kind of thing people notice. And then they will look a little bit harder. And it's all part of that security awareness yeah. as well. It bleeds right into that. And one flag stops all emails instantly from getting delivered to your users, which is kind of empowering your, your users on the, you know, on the front lines to also be a defense mechanism. Yeah, they can flag them, exactly. So knocking out the email and security awareness again, account compromise, how does AI AV power that? You know, traditional email sure. is what it was, but how does the AI factor and new antivirus really help kind of lock things down? Well, one of the other big methods uh, that, we'll, that uh, criminals will use to get information from you, get your password, is to install something like a keylogger, some malware that can glean that information from your machine. So once again, uh, a lot of the attacks these days are now becoming the zero-day attacks, where we don't have a signature. For that, uh, for that malware that's coming down to the machine. So again, we need something with artificial intelligence, something like a Silence uh, uh, antivirus, to see what the, the, uh, to see what the uh, file is doing, uh, to see what it looks like, its behavior, and then to flag it quickly, and then check it more to see what, uh, to see what uh, ill intent it might have. Sure, and it's no, it's no coincidence that Silence is actually used pretty heavily in the Defense Department, among other government institutions, and locking things down. It's it's almost crazy to still see the BlackBerry name um, hold its own with the security forefront. Sure and, uh, we all remember our our uh, our cell phones from back in the day, but I truly miss it. But moving on from that, um, so you've got the remote users, you've got a bunch of tools to protect the account. What's what's really like the, the kind of the basic vanilla 
you know, maybe it's overplayed, but, you know, is it MFA? And what exactly is MFA today? Because I think a lot of people kind of, it's been around since the, the old, you know, RSA key fob sure. tokens that are left at the desk while the, you know, finance director goes maybe out for lunch. How, how has that changed today? And really, what does it look like today? And why should we pay attention to it? So what we're trying to really prevent is the account compromise. And the number one way to do that is stealing someone's password. Now, at some point, you can't keep that from happening. Uh, someone can have binoculars and watch you at Starbucks type your password uh, in somewhere if they're well motivated. So we cannot just rely on the password. So multi-factor means we use something else. Now, uh, that something else could be something in addition to the password, or we might even eliminate the password altogether. Sure. But at the, very, at the very least, we want to add something onto the password. So uh, we would use one of, uh, or, or two or three of, of a couple of categories of things. Something that you know, like your password. Right. Something you are, like your fingerprint or your face, or a reader like that, that biometrics. Um, or something you have, something in your possession. So a typical MFA that most people are familiar with is I would use my password and then I'll, I would get a signal sent to an authenticator app that was on my phone. And I'll either have to touch and approve it or I'll have to type in a, a code that the phone has. Several ways to set that up. But that's a typical thing uh, that we could do. And there's, there's other things that we can add on to that as well. Even uh, not RSA keys, but there's new... Uh, FIDO keys, little hardware keys that sure. go a little bit further than the RSA keys or public-private key-based uh, encryption mechanisms, again, to prove that you're actually there and uh, uh, in possession of yeah, the key. Yeah, and you actually still see those, I think, in a lot of uh, federal government institutions. Absolutely. Your, your, your card that gets you into your office and it gets tracked by multi multiple, uh, you know, Wi-Fi, for instance, mm -hmm. is also your uh, your 2FA. Sure. Um, back. And that being said, let's just say you're at Starbucks and you're using uh, open Wi-Fi. You know, MFA is something that you can then, you know, even if they know your login and password and pick it off through, you know, a, a, you know open Wi-Fi attack, mm -hmm. They can also not get past that with MFA because you still need your phone to approve it at the time that it was you logging in. And that's the whole idea. You know, and also something. alert that someone's trying to ineffectively log in and alert you to that as well. Sure. Yeah, uh, something outside of the normal uh, chain. We have to have two different uh, avenues. Yeah, and, and, if, and if users do start getting uh, prompts on their phone that they didn't initiate, once again, that's where user uh, awareness training comes in. We give them something to do. Uh, for that situation, so MFA, everyone, everyone's heard a logo. You've got your, you've got your CyberArks, your Adaptives, your Microsoft Authenticators. You know, how do you get that set up? Because everybody buys a license, and they're like, "Great, we've got a license. Now, what do we do?" And if you don't have an MSP, that that might come as a little bit of a shock because there's some back end tooling you got to do. There is. It requires some expertise. It's not a difficult lift though once you know what you're doing. So. What, uh, what really drives the MFA nowadays is conditional access. And now MFA, it used to be, and you can actually still do this, where we'd actually put MFA on an account. We'd just put it right on an account. Now what that meant was you got MFA, you got bothered every single time you tried to do any little thing. And that actually is in itself not good. That Every goes screen against screensaver, your shutdown. Exactly. Your so that pulse. actually forces users now to try and find a way around that. Yep. And they see the MFA prompt so much that when when one comes up that shouldn't be there, they don't even notice. And we want them to notice. So these days, uh, the way we should be doing MFA is with something called conditional access. And conditional access lets us do a lot of other things other than MFA, but it's really the driver behind MFA. Uh, conditional access is uh, something like uh, if, uh, this, if your uh, logon comes from inside the corporate boundary yep. and uh, we know it's you, it's from a device we know about, maybe we don't require an MFA. But if your signal comes from somewhere else, a coffee shop somewhere going to your mailbox, well maybe then we do require MFA. So we can put a lot of different uh, conditions around it, but uh, to start out with, uh, we do really want a baseline, a baseline of, of Ford policies that will really get us to the point where we can really knock off 99% of the attacks out there. So all users have MFA step one. Mm -hmm. Step two of four is, I'm guessing, some kind of admin level. Sure. So, yeah. So the first one we put into place is uh, all users MFA. And we don't want it, that, them to be bugged too much because, again, that goes against 
security if they get bothered too much. So Microsoft has done a lot of work in this to eliminate uh, the, uh, the MFA prompts while still making everyone safe and keeping that MFA going. So that's the first thing we take, uh, take care of that applies to everyone. Then we have a couple of policies, two policies, to handle administrative access because that's the real danger. Someone stealing an administrator's password and gaining administrative control over our tenants. So we take care of that from two points of view. We take all of our administrative roles that have you know, uh, access to critical either the whole critical, sure. the whole tenant, or even you know, big parts of it like the exchange, uh, the exchange environment. Yep. And we make them always MFA when they come in. Yes, for them, that's gonna be a more of a pain in the neck. That's okay, they understand that. They shouldn't be doing this stuff, you know, that's not an everyday, every second of the day thing. Risk reward for sure. Risk reward, so we do that, and then we also take it from another point of view. There are certain avenues into Office 365 and Azure that you can take. There's portals for the administrative portals. We make all of those portals MFA because a regular user could actually go into one of those portals. So we want to make sure anyone accessing any path that would bring them administrative uh, uh, tools, we want that to be MFA'd as well. The legacy authentication uh, actually goes against MFA. And by legacy authentication, I mean all the old ways that we used not too long ago. In fact, they're still being used, which is why we have to worry about them. To access mainly email. Uh, these old school ways used only passwords and they couldn't use MFA. And they're still around. And that's the problem. They're still around. We have to account for them. Well, if you cannot use MFA with these, then you don't have to use MFA with them, and they're an easy way in. So now, if I'm a criminal and I know your company is using these legacy authentications, and guess what? A ton of companies still are. Well, now I have a path in where I don't have to MFA. If I guess your password, that's it. I'm in. So we need to eliminate that. And the, then, and the way we do that is we don't just turn it off, because if we just turn it off, well, a lot of people at your company are suddenly not going to be getting their emails Dance because, yep. exactly, we have to make sure that no one, you know, or that most of the people are off of those legacy protocols. So the first thing we would do is get a list of all users who are signing and using legacy authentication. Then we'd try and figure out how we can move as many of those, if not all of them, to a modern authentication client. Now we're going to identify printers, we're going to identify service accounts and, and other things like that that we just can't move right now. Right. Okay, well we make exceptions for them. We lock it down to the account, to the IP address they're coming from. There's ways we can make that a lot more secure and then we block the rest of it. So it's almost like you map one for one the legacy applications or portals, mm -hmm. but then after that block rest and you really don't have to worry about leaving some gaping hole in an S AS 400 that was forgotten years ago that's right. still ticking away doing some time card drill and if you can't migrate it the answer is you could still have the security in place you mm -hmm. just have to make sure that it's fit for a legacy authentication because it obviously can't handle today's MFA until it can on a migration exactly yeah okay so MFA is now in place we've kind of tightened that up now in the you know quarterly event that we all see where it's hey it's time to you know due to your security compliance have to you know, issue yourself a new password let's just say let's just say you forgot to add that excla exclamation or ampersand how do we make that process more efficient because without MFA properly working with the password that's needed how do we kind of these users are from home they can't go over to the IT help desk and say hey I've locked myself out can sure. you quickly flip me? you know how do we do you know how do we tackle that in today's you know, remote worker environment with COVID? Sure, so uh, that brings up a great point. Now, traditionally speaking, what a user might do is call the help desk up or go down to the help desk, I forgot my password, can you reset my password for me? And that still goes on even remotely. You know, they'll get a call needing to, to reset their out. password, lock myself I out. Well, last month. <laughs> th this, this presents two problems, this old school way of doing it. Number one, this is a huge time killer for the help desk. Most help desk calls are still about password resets and it really it lowers productivity, it costs a lot, but number two, it's also, believe it or not, it's a security hole because if I'm involving a third party to change my password, that gives the criminals an opportunity to step in between that process and fool me into thinking I'm talking to somebody I'm not talking to. They so, can actually call your help desk 
masquerading as the user who may or may there not be go. locked out, or they just lock them out themselves. Or they call you uh, as the user. Yeah, uh, asking the new about worker that. from uh, a state you don't live in, mm -hmm. and I need my password reset. And yeah. So how do we prevent that? Well, again, user awareness training to, to get past those scams. But the big thing is allowing the users to reset their own password with something called self-service password reset. Now, when I first uh, say that to someone, they're like, well, we can't user, have users doing that themselves. That sounds insecure. And it could be, but it isn't. We make this very secure. We give them uh, the same techniques that you, they use in MFA. In fact, we can have an extra MFA that's required or even two extra so that you can require. layer on a challenge or two because it's an SSPR exactly. request. So they might have forgotten their password, but they will need to get maybe an authenticator prompt and also an email sent to them or maybe even answering questions. We have a few different options. Sure. So we, yes, we can layer things on so we can make absolutely sure that the user is who they say they are. Now they change their own password. It's a great experience for the user. It's very fast, doesn't harm productivity and that takes the, it takes that third party phone call or email that that interaction out of the picture and it actually makes it more secure so your help desk can actually do business business productive tasks instead of right. the fire drills that the password resets are exactly yeah yeah i'm sure they would not miss those calls and uh, I, i'm pretty sure it bogs down our, our current help desk today for, for clients that don't have this in place but again it just has to be set up correctly yeah and if it's secure why not let the users you know do this themselves um it kind of just gets rid of that extra vulnerability and security and also automates the whole process altogether mm -hmm. so you know you've got everything in place you've got the you've got mfa you've got the baseline set up what are we missing? Like, is there something that our that your team sees in day to day that you know, just one final scan? That you've got all the contractors coming in, working on the renovations. The, the everything's tightened up, painted. You know, did they remember to sweep up, for instance, and throw out their garbage? Sure. You know, how does that translate to to the final step? You know, how do we use traditional AD on prem to some of the tools that are now afforded to us with Azure? So remember, you know, what we're trying to get to is that uh, that basic security baseline you know we're you know we're, we're safe from most of the threats that were coming in we can build from there but one of the things that yeah, is often overlooked is that cleanup or that that maintenance that just taking another eye or look at the communication between our on-premise active directory structure and the office 365 and most of our customers and most companies that use office 365 they'll start out with an on-premise domain they'll copy or sync all those users to the cloud because you need users in the cloud to actually use cloud resources. It's required. You can't actually use that account on premise. So we keep them in sync. Well, a lot of times uh, these tools were installed uh, a few years ago. They get out of date. Uh, there are sync issues that, ha that, uh, aren't, uh, that aren't looked at. So uh, what we like to do is go and make sure that everything is up to date, look for sync issues, look for the sync health, make sure things like the Active Directory uh, recycle bin have been turned on. Uh, that's a, a huge thing, it's a simple thing, but it's a, it's, a, it's a big important thing because of this. If you were to delete someone, you always delete someone from the Active Directory side. That deletes them in Azure. If you made a mistake and you didn't turn the recycle bin on, it is extremely difficult to undo that mistake. You can't just recreate the user because it's a brand new user according to everything involved. So we turn the recycle bin on, we can bring that user back easily. So one of those small gotchas that it's sometimes are gotcha. often forgotten that could save your admins hours and hours of, of rebuild time. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and and I'm sure that's not a fun task to do, <laughs> and I'm sure it's on this list because uh, we've we've either learned ourselves the hard way or uh, learned through other customers. Yeah, we run into it, but it does sound like that's definitely something you need to just one final just you know you run spell checker before you send a document out. You you know it's just to tighten up the the last couple steps. So it's good to know that. You know, these things, you know, do have a, a final, the baseline is the baseline, but again, you want to tie it all back together. And in doing that, you know, we're, we're going to just kind of summarize what we've talked about today. You know, we've provided with a bunch of solutions for ransomware and, and account compromise. You know, I'm sure this stuff, you know, doesn't really come at a great cost, traditionally speaking. We're not buying $50,000 firewalls, a couple per premise here. We're talking about really seats and licenses and how they add on. 
Yeah, it, it, it's yeah, it's not break the bank time. You know, this these are things that if you know what you're doing, you can set them up fairly quickly and securely, and they don't break the bank. So a, a lot of these things will come right with uh, uh, licenses that uh, most uh, of our customers are getting through Microsoft. The uh, the other things, uh, the silence, antivirus, uh, artificial intelligence based, the Mimecast, secure email. Yeah, you're right. This, these are just a, a few dollars per license uh, added on to every user. So it's not break the bank time. These are these these are uh, uh, things that should be uh, uh, used and should be uh, brought into your general security posture, and they they pay for themselves. So from going from a nice to have to now a need to have in today's COVID remote worker you're really not just deploying tools that have instant value as far as reporting. Um, if you have any kind of compliance drills, I'm sure you just can't say, yeah, I'm doing it. You probably have to show some kind of, you know, run books or results showing you're doing certain things. Um, but also the, you know, how long does it take to deploy these? Is it, is it months? Is it quarterly? I mean, what's the ramp up? What's the delivery time? How fast can your team spin up, you know, secure email gateway for Mimecast, for instance, or well, we'll just, I guess we'll start there. Yeah we're, yeah, we're not talking uh, months, really, or even weeks. These are things that uh, are well understood uh, by Archon and things that we can implement in a short amount of time. Uh, we can get this working and, and set the structure up uh, to get you to that security level uh, fairly quickly, which is our goal. And, and once it's set up, it's not set it and forget it, see you later, moving on. There's, no. there's tuning that goes on with, with security email gateways and, and payload. Uh, you know, stripping software, mm -hmm. and that's we're not just walking away. Your team's constantly engaging the client to make sure that they're optimized along the way. Um, for training, that's a different case because now training can't really be done in a day. Nobody really wants to do training mm -hmm. in a day. That uh, it's like chewing broken glass. I mean, everybody can probably remember those those long days that need to be done. How does training now fit that model? Like the setup maybe needs to go over quarterly, have a plan to it, but. Sure. What's the initial handshake look like between our common clients? So the, the, the training really uh, for user education training, awareness training, is really modular based. So again, it's license based uh, uh, per user. And uh, yeah, you don't want to bring everybody in for, you know, let's do two days of security awareness training. Goodbye, we'll see you in six months. That just doesn't work. We need the constant reminders, nothing too intrusive, short, easy to understand, engaging segments, uh, supplemented by actual real-world tests uh, all the time so we keep that going we keep on top of it and yeah you said it yourself uh, this is no longer a set it and forget it uh, attitude it can't be in today's IT and and the things that we were talking about there were nice to haves a few years ago yes there must have their table stakes uh, today especially with the remote uh, atmosphere that we're dealing with uh, and all of these things to get to that security baseline are really must-haves. And now your team can tailor the message for PCI, for instance, in one direction to a team, thumb drive, a hex to another team, and really you can you can actually vector the training to the vectored attacks coming in as well by division inside a company, correct? Absolutely. So yeah, this kind of training starts out with some basic modules, basic do's and don'ts, and then yes, it can take uh, several paths depending on the industry. HIPAA, what have you? And silence. So AV back in the day, that takes you know, that's just a you know a disc in a drive, spin up the CD, and you're good to go. Or you know, does AI really complicate that, or does the cloud really uncomplicate it? Well, we'll always have a, a delivery mechanism to get to get it uh, installed, uh, which is that you know that that's the same as it is everywhere. The cloud actually uncomplicates it because now we're actually paying attention to all these machines from one central place, so we can update them, we can tweak them. Uh, we can, uh, you know, create extra rules. We can do a, a security scan. You know, we can get reports all in one central place. So it really makes everyone's job a lot easier. The user doesn't have to be involved uh, in doing anything to this. It's really cloud-based, and that's the way we want it. And not just the endpoints. We also want to tighten up the servers as well. Servers, everything. So we're talking, I mean, a week at most from 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 first scope call to deliverable working you know, fine tuning aside on the back end, uh, it's really not that hard of a lift to get that up and running for most clients. No, we, yeah, we, for, for most clients, we can ramp up all of this in a short amount of time. Great. Cloud backup, gotta ask, uh, you know, in the unlikely event that it happens, 
you know, setting up a OneDrive pro- policy program with Runbooks. You know, how how does that how does that look for someone trying to roll out? You know, just kind of the the backup just in case scenarios. Well, for OneDrive, it, it's simply a policy that we would uh, get down to the machine. Uh, typical ways would be a group policy or, or an MDM solution like uh, Intune. We basically just tell. Uh, the machine to require users to log into OneDrive. We move their current uh, documents and desktop over to OneDrive, educate them on uh, putting their important information into OneDrive. It's very easy. It shows up as a big blue cloud on their Explorer. You can't miss it. So that's pretty easy to do. And it's always great. I mean, as much Knox as you know, people will give Microsoft from time to time on the quick changes, it's, it's definitely more compatible to keep that in-house inside sure. the Microsoft family for sure. Um, so moving past the tools and obviously the, the third-party services and, and refining that we do, the professional services, we're, we're not talking months here. We're talking, you know, for the security baseline work that your team does in each drill between the multi-factor authentication, conditional access, you know, health checkup and final, you know, fine-tuning, what's that actually look like? Is it, is it over a quarter? Is it kind of, you know, a couple weeks' time, plan in place, scope call? Yeah, within a few weeks, uh, we can get uh, uh, pretty much all of this uh, taken care of. We get a scoping call, and, and this is, again, these are things we, that are well understood. We know how to do them. Uh, we've done them before a lot. Do them today, we do sure. them today. Uh, we do them for ourselves. So it's something we understand, and this is something that can be put into place very quickly. We want that security baseline in place. Now, from there, we can expand, and we always do. I mean, there's always... You know, depending on your industry, on your needs, on where your users are, different things can, you know, we, you know, we add on to that. But really the baseline is where we, we must start. And from this, it's the foundation that each client will then have to then get to that higher level exactly. of, of specific compliance if it's, if it's applicable for sure. And this all comes with a dedicated tech and a team from Archon that they're there to kind of help walk through all the nuances of each system. and. And given their their background in doing this multiple times, it's, it it seems like it goes pretty flawless as far as you know each system's never the same. Uh, with that, Joe, appreciate your time here. Um, the webinar has been great for kind of bringing back some of the things that you've seen on the front lines with your team. I uh, appreciate you talking about this and uh, sharing everything you've 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 seen from the trenches. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. It was great to, to be here. Glad to catch up again, and I look forward to the next one. Great, we look forward to having you. And thanks for joining us here on the webinar at Archon. We always bring uh, stuff we see to light from customers and from market trends, and we hope to see you soon. Of course, reach out to Joe or myself at any time. Our information will follow this deck. We're here to answer any questions, and look forward to working with you in the near future. Thank you again. Okay, everyone, that is the end of our webinar. Now we will be starting our Q&A session shortly, where Derek and Joe will be on answering any questions that you have. If anyone came to the webinar late and wasn't able to ask any questions, feel free to use that chat feature up at the top right, and we will answer them as they come in. Great, thanks, Dan. If we get set up, uh, Joe will be joining us shortly. Uh, appreciate everybody um, sending questions in. Uh, quick answer on the first question is, as Joe rejoins, uh, we're definitely going to get this uh, material out to everybody. So thanks for asking. Uh, you can either reach out to the contacts below or your your sales rep. We're here to answer any questions you have now or later. Um, so that also includes content and PowerPoints. Uh, we'll get that out to you, and also keep keep posted to our social media. We'll we'll, we'll get that to you. Uh, with updates to come, so. Awesome. So our first question that came in <clears throat> is, hello, my company is currently using Proofpoint Anti-Phishing Suite, Proofpoint Wombat Security Awareness Training, and Okta for MFA. How can your offering improve our current program? Great question. Um, those are all big names. Joe, uh, 
I, I kind of know where we would probably answer this, but I'm, I'm going to let you answer this first, obviously, being the, uh, the SME on this. Sure. Uh, uh, well, I would say to that, yeah, uh, Octo is a good product. Um, and uh, Proofpoint uh, you have for uh, your Anna phishing, uh, email security. One thing we notice in uh, the third parties when, when we're using Okta or some of the other ones uh, that are out there, some of the other like Duo is that uh, conditional access sometimes is not used. Uh, we, they put the MFA in place, which is nice, but there's no conditions uh, that we, we base access on. So the Microsoft's Office 365 and Azure Active Directory conditional access policies really still have to be in place uh, along with, uh, you know, the uh, blocking legacy access that, that's also in, in that conditional access. So uh, that's one area where I would, I would uh, caution people to take a, a really good look at. Uh, uh, sometimes you get a sense of security with the, uh, with the uh, third-party MFA, and there's that uh, condition, the conditional access is, is missing. Yeah, and I've definitely um, definitely heard from some of our team in the in the knock that you know a lot of them have you know pros and cons, but you know proof point you might want to challenge the lack of complexity, which is fine for a lot a lot of uh, clients. Um, with complexity, the price tag goes up, and then you know the management you know management resources needed to run it properly also uh, also kind of starts to tax the team a little bit. So um, yeah, that's the, yeah, that's the other thing are, uh, you know, uh, just turning it on or having it in place really isn't enough. Uh, you know, uh, uh, all of these things, they're not, uh, you know, set it and forget it, turn them on. Uh, Archon's configuration service really have to be brought in to get it right. Yeah, and I, and I would also, I mean, there's no anybody that says the the one solution fits all. I mean, it's you really just want to be in that you know the leading twenty five percentile of uh, you know proper proper logos. Um, wrote you know any kind of past performance is huge, but it's not just it's not just that alone. So you know, clients definitely need to kind of keep in mind that you know it's also the management side of things too. Because I'll be the first to say some of the marketing on 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 competing solutions is great. Uh, until you kind of you, you kind of get the the guys wrenching and the, the women in the knock wrenching on stuff, and they're like, hold on, this this is starting to fall apart a little bit. So, you know, do your homework, uh, lean on experts. You know, being part of this webinar definitely helps. You know, tighten those unknowns up. But uh, with that, uh, you, you can definitely be in good good shape just having you know the basics in place with with one of the leaders. Uh, so next question. Yep, go ahead, Danny. How does Azure specifically change how you set up, manage the traditional recycling bin? What are the risks in forgetting this step? Well, that's a good question. It doesn't change anything actually about the recycle bin. The recycle bin has been around for many years now. Uh, it addressed a problem with Active Directory where uh, when you deleted an object before it became available, uh, then that object would be uh, uh, turn into something called a tombstone object, uh, and then it would be deleted later on. The problem with the tombstone, a tombstone object was most of its properties would be stripped away from it, uh, and they would be gone. So Microsoft introduced this recycle bin to allow you to untombstone an object, to bring it back with all of its properties. Uh, you, you used to be able to bring something back, but you would get the username and a couple of other things, everything else would be missing and you were basically starting from scratch. Now, this problem compounds itself uh, if you don't have it turned on when we move to the cloud because all of these objects are being created on premise and they're being managed. All the properties get managed on premise. So if you delete something on premise, it gets deleted in the cloud. Now, even though it might be tombstone on premise and, and deleted, if you try and bring it back, that cloud uh, object will also be stripped almost down to nothing. So uh, the, the penalty for not turning it on is if you accidentally delete one user or a thousand users, you're basically recreating those thousand users. Whereas if you had turned the recycle bin on, you could bring back the users on premise. They would be once again replicated up to the cloud and you would have them right back to where they were. So it, it's, it doubles its importance when we bring the cloud in. 
Does Silence have a solution for endpoints that aren't connected to the web? Well, uh, uh, yeah, I would say all of AV products uh, have uh, two main parts: are the the engine that runs on the uh, uh, the uh, workstation, and then uh, they have uh, reporting uh, services, and most of them are cloud based. So you you can get uh, uh, the 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 endpoint on there and not take advantage of the cloud. It's uh, much nicer to, to have all of that aggregated in the cloud. Uh, I don't know if I'm putting that correct, Derek. You can help me out if I'm um, if I didn't say that quite right. No, it's um, I, I, it's funny you mentioned that because they just um, they just did a um, a quarterly update. Um, Silence, as everybody may or may not know, is the old uh, BlackBerry logo. So, um, I know they're currently rolling out even more feature sets, um, and it's it's getting it's getting pretty deep. So, I mean, we're trying to catch up on on the R and D side as we dog food a lot of these things before we roll them out. Um, but I, we can definitely go in more detail if anybody has questions on that. Awesome. Is. Can you please send us a copy of this presentation for reference? Yeah, and so to just kind of repeat that, we we 100% can. Um, my information's on the slide right now, as, as well as Joe's. Please reach out. Uh, this stuff will be uh, once we compile it, post. We'll have it all uh, packaged up. Uh, the powerpoints will be uh, PDFs for anybody that needs it. Please uh, also let your team know if they couldn't make it, but they did RSVP. We will be posting a um, an automated link for the video uh, for future reference. And um, with that, I think our Q and A's are done. So Joe, again, thanks for uh, being a part of this. And uh, this is Derek Marnick giving it back to you. Back to you, Danny. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. That being said, that is the end of our webinar. Thank you so much to everyone who joined. Um, like Derek said, if anyone has any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to him or Joe, and they can answer those for you. Um, and then in the meantime, you saw that we will be having a future webinar. Um, until that comes out, please follow us on any social media for updates on when that will be out. Thanks so much for joining and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks all.